All right, in this video, we are gonna start talking about Git and how to use it. Um, and Git is just an amazing piece of software for version control um, when you're doing coding or other projects that involve a lot of plain text files. So it's, it's, it's really kind of like a, a powerful tool to have in your toolbox. So I'm really excited to get the chance to, to teach it to people in this class. And I'm always very excited to see students who have taken the class using it later for their research projects. So Git is what's called a version control system. There are a few out there, but recently Git has really risen in prominence to, to be um, the most common one used, I think, certainly in a lot of, of coding projects. And, and a lot of that plays in with the popularity of GitHub as well, which we're going to talk about later. That's a, a platform for sharing things that are tracked under Git. So what it does is it takes a directory of files and it will let you track all the changes that get made to all of the files in that directory. And once a directory of files is tracked with this, we start calling it a repository, a Git repository. Um, what this does is it lets you go back after you've made changes and you can see what changes you made. You can take changes out. You can even, it even lets you kind of do these branches where you've got separate versions of the directory going and you can try out new things in one branch. And if it doesn't work, you just chop it off. And if it does work, you can pull it back into your main branch. It turns out that it's a really powerful tool also for collaborating with other people. It gives you a lot of flexibility to not feel like you're stepping on each other's toes or doing something that's kind of like irreversible and wrong. Instead, it gives everybody on the project the chance to put in their own work, and then you can try to pull it all in together and, and kind of like make it work at the end. And it really gracefully integrates changes from different people if they're in different parts of the code base. Sometimes you have to do a little bit more work if you're trying to make the same change at the same point. But it does this work really well on files that are plain text files. For binary files like Word files or Excel files, it doesn't really like it's hard to see what the changes were when they were tracked. Um, but for a lot of the files we work with in R, so R markdown files for writing up reports and R scripts for writing the code itself or functions or things like that, um, data files, if we're keeping them in a plain text format like CSV, it does a really nice job of tracking those changes and showing from point to point what has changed and allowing you to go back to past versions. Um, I found this online and I think it's a very effective flowchart. So this is a flowchart for whether or not you need version control for your project. It starts up here. Do you need it? Yes. Then you install Git. Uh, do you need it? If you answer no, then it, it, it informs you no. In fact, you do need it. And then you install Git. Um, it really is something that I think a lot of people don't realize how useful it's going to be until they really get into using it on a large project. But once you do, I, um, I think a lot of people really heartily embrace it. And there are a lot of huge advantages to using it in, in your scientific coding. Um, one that doesn't get advertised a lot in terms of the version control piece for people doing large software projects comes out when you're trying to, to do reports in scientific research. So um, a lot of times before I started using Git and GitHub a lot for, for writing up papers and, and working with students and things like that, a lot of times you get in this case that's described through this comic. So, you know, you start working on a paper, and, and you name the paper that you think is the final one, final.doc, and then, you know, somebody goes through and does all the revisions, and then you end up with final rev.2.doc, and then final rev.6.comments.doc, and you get all just like this, this huge list of different files with different file names, and it becomes very confusing which one's the active one, and people end up working on the wrong version of different things, and once you get large groups of people working on documents, it seems that this can often happen. And one of the nice things that happens with Get is because you're tracking the changes and because it has these functions for kind of somebody suggesting changes through a branch and then you deciding whether or not you want to pull those back in, it means that you can just have one version of each file that you're working on. So you just have like a document that's your paper file and you just have the ones that are your R scripts and those are changing, but you don't feel that need to have like 10 or 20 different copies of them so that you can always get back to the old one in case there was something that you deleted from it in the next version that, that you decide, no, I really want that. Because with version control, all of that's still in there. You can find it through your old commits and your old history. Like once you delete something, if it's under version control, it's not really gone. It's, it's, it's just reserved 
in the changes in that version. So you end up with much, much cleaner directories where it becomes very clear exactly which document you want to work on it at any point in time. So Git is open source like R. It's also free. Um, you can download it from for different operating systems. And I put the link in here that will take you um, to the site where you download that. So you can go through and pick your operating system, and then it'll take you through the process of downloading it for that operating system. Now, Git is a separate piece of software from R. And so when we're using it in to work with R and especially to interface with R Studio, R Studio is really trying to connect with something else on your computer. Um, R is wonderful in being able to interface with other things operating on your system. It's one of its great strengths, I think. But we will see in the class that we're likely to have some cases where um, there might be some things that don't go smoothly or where the directions I have here don't exactly work on your computer. And some of that comes down to these differences in operating systems and even in how your computer is set up within that operating system. And so that's why we're, we're, we have plenty of time in class where we'll go through and really work on making sure the setup works for you. So feel free to try this out as we go through, but don't be alarmed if it does not completely work on your computer because um, every year we end up going through some troubleshooting for at least some computers to make sure that that our studio can find the version of Git you downloaded and installed and, and just that everything kind of connects and works smoothly. So don't be alarmed if these don't work, although for probably about 90% of the class, the stuff that I will cover in these slides should work all right. All right, so once you have installed Git on your computer, Try restarting RStudio. RStudio often will be able to find it. There are kind of some standard places that things can get installed on your computer, and RStudio can look there. And if it's in one of those regular places, it will likely find it automatically, and you won't have to do a lot of extra stuff. Um, you will need to tell R that, that you might need to tell R that that's what you want to use. And certainly within projects, we'll need to tell it that. So once you've installed Get and you've loaded it, go into your RStudio. And we're going to check and see if it has been able to find it. You can go into Tools. And for our studio, you can set options that will work across any code you work on, any projects, anything like that. Or you can set options that are specific to a single project. So this chapter, we'll be doing some of both of these. To make sure that our studio is set up to recognize um, to recognize Git, you need to do a global option because we want it to be able to find it regardless of which project we're in. So you'll go down to global options, and there's this little, this little um, box down here for get and SVN. If you click on that, you do want to make sure that this box is clicked to enable version control interface for our studio projects. And then um, if you're lucky, if you've crossed your fingers, then our studio has hopefully been able to identify the get executable when you downloaded and installed that on your computer. If you don't see anything here, you could try browsing to find that. Sometimes these are stored a little bit of odd places if you're not used to doing a lot of your own kind of like software installation. So if you can't find it immediately, that's okay. That's something that we can go through and um, try, try to resolve during the in-class exercises we set this up for everyone. But hopefully you will already see something listed here. And if you do, then our studio has recognized where your version of Get that you installed is, and you'll be able to do the next steps pretty easily. All right, the next thing that you want to do if you are just installing Get and starting to use it, there are just a couple of pieces that you want to configure for Get itself. The main two are that you want to set what your username is and you want to set what your user email is. And then it's nice to set these because when you make changes in a repository, especially one where you're working with a lot of people, the commits will get tagged with your name and with your email address. Um, you can do this using git config and you'll do that in the terminal. You'll put your name in and then put your email address in. And here I'm using my work email address. I would recommend that you use one that you anticipate will be pretty stable over time. So if you're a student, your university one might change once you graduate. So if you have a Gmail one, you might want to put that one in instead. So to do this configuration for Get, you're actually going to do it at what's called the terminal. RStudio allows you to use that. Um, 
you might have a pane up here where you can access that in our studio. And when you do, um, there tend to be some differences in the defaults in terms of whether this is likely to pull up a bash shell for you or whether it's likely to pull up, um, especially if you're working on Windows, something, something else. I think that's a PowerShell maybe. Um, so one thing that you can do is to check, you could try using a Unix command. So there are all these different Unix commands. Uh, PWD stands for print working directory. That's kind of like get WD in R. So you can type those three letters and use this as kind of a check to make sure that it is a bash shell. Um, when you do that, it should print out a directory for you. If it's not using bash, it's likely to say that that's a command it doesn't recognize. So again, this is a point where we might need to do some, some kind of troubleshooting with your computer just to make sure we get you set up correctly during the in-class work. Um, but one thing that you can check is you can go up into your tools and go to your global options. And there's a, a, a place there for terminal as well. So you might be able to fix it yourself if you look for this new terminals open with. And if you have a choice of bash there, if you change to bash, that might be enough to get it working. And if not, again, that's something that we will be there to work with you on during the, the in-class exercises for this chapter. So once you have this opened up, to set the username for get and then to set the, um, the, the email for get, you can do get config, this stands for configure. And then we want to do this globally. We want to do this like not for a single get project, but for any get project you're working on. And then you can do user.name and put your name in, in quotation marks. All right, so that should set up your username and then you can do get config and do global again. And this time we'll do user email and there put in the email address you want. And again, if you have something that's more stable than a university one, you might wanna put that in. All right. So once you've done this process, you've gotten get on your computer, you've gotten RStudio to recognize where it is, and you've done this one step to set up and let get know what your username and your user email are, you should be set up where you can take an R project that you have and for just that project, set it up with this tracking, set it up to be a Git repository. So for this, this is something that we're doing just for single projects. So um, we can go through, I've got this practice R project that we set up a while ago when we first talked about projects in the videos. So I've got that and it's not set up to be under version control with Git yet. So what I can do is go to tools and now I want to look for the project options. This is just something that I want to do for a project. You set up this like Git repository. You do that kind of project by project. So setting it up for one project will not set it up for your other projects. You have to do it for each one specifically. So go down to project options. And that also has this get SVN area. In the version control system, you should be able, if RStudio has recognized where Git is, to select Git here. It will ask you if you really want to initialize that as a Git repository, and you click yes. And at that point, it will restart your RStudio session because it needs to kind of like hook some things in when it opens up to get Git set up. Once it does, you should see that up here in your pane, you have a new window now. You have a Git window. And this will have a few things. Um, so when you first start, um, you don't have any of your files that have been kind of like committed yet into the repository. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But if everything has worked successfully up to this point, you should now have a Git window in this specific R project. All right, so I just mentioned once you do that, you'll have this Git window. And this is a window where you can make what are called commits, and then you can also look at what's called your history. So this is what this window will look like. It will keep track of things that have either haven't been tracked yet, like are not being tracked at all, or things that, um, that, that are being tracked but have been changed since the last time that they were committed. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about this idea of committing. So when you want to record a change in a file, you commit that file with the changes. When you first start a Git repository, you need to commit any files that you have there initially, and that will kind of like um, take a picture of what those files look like at that point, and that serves as a baseline as you make these changes. Um, each time you do a commit, you have to include just a little bit of information about what you're doing. So you have to include at least something short, but you can also, there's also a space where if you need to talk more about what you're doing and why you're doing it, there's a space where you can do that as well. You can do all of these just using a terminal, using, using a shell, kind of like how we set those values for initializing get. Um, but in this course, we're really going to use the RStudio tools because I think they're a little bit more visual. They're a little bit more intuitive as you're getting started. So we'll do all these changes. As we do these changes, they're just going to be saved and recorded locally with the first step that we do. And then later, we'll talk about how to connect the repository that we made on our computer with one that's stored remotely somewhere. And the main one that we'll use are ones that are stored remotely on GitHub. And then with you and team members, you can all connect from your computer to that one that's stored remotely. And to do that, you'll take these commits that you've made on your computer and we'll do what's called pushing to get them up to the remote. And then if somebody else has pushed something up to the remote that you wanna get, that's called pulling those changes onto your computer. All right, so let's take a look. Right now, we've got all of our initial files here for this project. There's one special one that's called git ignore. This gets added when you have a git repository. And this puts in all of the files that git won't follow. So this, it turns out this is really helpful to have. If you have some files that are really just output files that are really large files and you don't want um, get to track those just because it leads to large commits, then you could put that here. Another one you can do um, with, with my computer, which is running Mac, we get this .ds store file a lot, and it does not need to be tracked. It's something where I think Mac's just tracking some stuff and behind the scenes, but we can put that in. And you'll see once we put a name of a file in here and save it, it should be removed over here. It looks like this one's not being, but maybe once we commit the get, we'll see that disappear. Um, other things are showing up here as well. So we've got like our, our, our markdown, those two files are here. The R project file itself also shows up. So we'll wanna commit that. And then it's got kind of whole directories too. So we've got this data directory that's got several files and you can see that that's showing up. Oh, there we go. Now it's taken the DS store off and has recognized the get ignore. Okay, so we can click on all of these and we'll do what's called our initial commit. We're going to take all of the files that we have starting off in our repository and we're going to save them to, to kind of initialize this process of tracking them all. So to commit a file, you click on it here. When you click on these that are directories, you'll see like it expands out to all the files that were inside that. So I'm clicking all of them. We can go to commit. And for when we commit these files, we have to put in a message about what we're doing. So this very first time, I'm just going to say initial commit. And now we do commit, and you'll see this message of the changes that it's making. So now that we've committed it, since we haven't changed any of these files since our last commit, you can see that everything's empty up here in our window. Now when we make changes, they'll show up in that window once we made a change and we can record those changes. So let's take a look at doing that. One of the files that we have in here was an example R markdown. So we can take a look here and you can see that it's got like an example equation. Maybe let's change that. So maybe let's do um, plus gamma um, Z T. So we've added this piece here. As soon as we save it, it's going to show up in our Git window. So I'll save it here, and you can see over here that we have that show up. Now if we go to the commit window, it will actually show us for the file the difference between what we had before and what we've added now. So it's showing in red what the line looked, at be looked like before when we had the kind of simpler equation. And then it shows right here in green what the new line looks like. So we can click here and we can say that we are updating equation. 
You can just put the single message, but if you want to give a longer description, you can do that too. What you want to do there is to give a longer description, leave a blank line, and then you can put whatever you want after. So here we could put maybe um, we decided to add one more independent variable, dt. So the equation now reflects that. All right, so we can commit right here. You can see we've got a change made there too. And then we could go back and maybe let's like add one more column or two more columns in there. So we can do that. Run that code. Oh, sorry, this is rows. So we can see that we've got five rows now. And if we want to, we can knit the whole thing. Let's knit it to Word. All right, so if we go back in, you can see now that we have two files that have changed. One of them is the R markdown, where we made the actual changes. And then one, because we re-rendered that Word output, that has changed too. People have different styles for whether they track the outputs, like, um, a PDF or a Word file that's created by R Markdown. I think as you're starting out work, it's a little bit helpful because then you can all keep track of what, what's going on. But a lot of times as you progress and you get more comfortable with using R Markdown, um, I think it can make sense to not track that and just have everybody, once they pull it in, render it fresh on their own computer. Um, when we look at these files, we can again see that for R Markdown, We've got the change that we made there where we changed that slice statement on line 35. But if we look at the at the difference for that doc file, it's not really going to show as much. It's a binary file, so it can't really track the changes there in the same way it can change track them in plain text files. So the kind of like um the the history and the being able to see the changes. As I mentioned before, that's really something that's going to show up just in plain text files. And fortunately, a lot of the files we use in R are plain text files. It's R Markdown and R Scripts and CSV data files. Like all of those are plain text. We're going to, we're going to be able to see changes pretty easily. So we can say um, add two rows to table here and make that commit. All right. So once we've made those different commits, um, this other uh, tab here becomes interesting, this history. So we can look at the history, and this walks us through all of the changes that have been made since the initial commit. So the initial commit, again, was where we added in all of these files, and this is a really large change, so it's not going to show us that. But then we get through the step of updating the equation, and it's showing us the file where we made a change in this project. And then it also shows us the change that we made. And if you made a few changes in the file, it would kind of like show blocks with these different changes in different places. And then if we click here, we can also see the change that was made at that point to one of the files. You can also see some information over here, like the author and the email address. This is where we set with a kind of git config, we set what our name and our email was. And then you've also got this tag for the commit. Um, so this is um, a little string of letters and numbers you can use to later reference these commits. And if you wanted to go back and remove the change that you done at this stage, you can actually take, tell get to go back and that you want to start fresh from the commit before. So these tags can be used to revert changes, to go back on things that you did. Um, and also to kind of like explore different things that were happening along the way. All right, so I just went through this in our studio, but just briefly, when you are ready to make a commit, you can do that in the commit window. Um, and that opens a separate, sorry, pressing the commit button in the get window opens a separate commit window that looks like this, where you've got a list of the files that have changes since the last commit. And then you've got some information where it kind of walks you through what those changes were, and then also a space to make a commit and to put in your message for that commit. So again, when you want to make changes, you click on the file you want to commit. You can look through in the bottom part to make sure you understand those changes and you really do want to commit them. And then you write your message in the commit message box. So you, the message itself, you want to keep to one line. 
because in the history, as you go through, those are kind of things that you read going through and you don't want the, the message itself to kind of like go off where you can't read it anymore. But if you need to tell more, you can do that process that I showed where you skip a line and then you do a paragraph. And this actually goes back, it's tied to the idea of writing up an email where you might have the subject line that needs to be pretty short, but then you have the body of the email where you can explain anything you want to. So it might be helpful to think of it as, as that, to think of the message itself as kind of the subject line. And then if you need to write more, you do that um, after skipping a blank line. Then when you press commit, this gets recorded and it goes into the history. Um, it is helpful in your commit messages to write things that are meaningful. Um, I think everybody at some point or another, though, will get into the point where they're writing things that aren't so meaningful. So um, this is uh, from the, the comic XKCD. It's showing as a project drags on, my git commit messages get less and less informative. And it shows how it starts with these nice ones of like, I was doing the loop and the timing control. And then I worked on the configuration file some. And then as they get through the project, especially when you kind of are working with frustrating things or trying to fix bugs, a lot of times you might have some commit messages that are maybe not as useful. But as descriptive as you can keep them, that's gonna make this really helpful, especially when you work in a team, because that way it really lets you go through that history and remember what happened and pinpoint the places where specific things happen. So it is helpful to take the time to do meaningful commit messages. I also talked a little bit about this idea of the history being able to toggle to that and then that's got all of this information about what happened at specific points um, in the process. And this history really builds up. It really gets to be quite long. So we can look like right now, this was practice R, but we also have the whole, um, all the material with slides and the course book and all of the pieces like that for this book are in an R Studio project that's under Git version control. And so if you go and you look on that in the commit window and go into the history, you can see that that's really, really long. Like we've got um, lots and lots and lots of things that have happened there. And some of them are maybe more meaningful and some of them might be less meaningful, but it's got like a really long history of the things that are happening. And then the ones that do have meaningful commit messages, it might make a little bit more sense when you go through and try to understand exactly what was happening at that point. 